Hello, welcome to Introduction to Benchmarking, Energy Star Portfolio Manager 101. My name is Isaac Smith. I work for the Green Building Alliance as the Pittsburgh 2030 District Building Performance Analyst. Today in the 101 session, we will be going over an overview of Portfolio Manager in the context of 2030 challenge goals. We have some learning objectives to go through today, uh, the first of which is learning how to navigate and understanding Portfolio Manager as a tool. We will also be talking about adding and ed editing property information uh, in addition to entering energy and water data at the meter level and understanding performance metrics within the context of the 2030 district and within Portfolio Manager itself. So what exactly is Portfolio Manager? Portfolio Manager is a program, an online free tool through Energy Star and the EPA um, for management of energy, water, data in the sense of whole building consumption. Um, you have the ability to assess this sort of data over time while tracking changes in cost, uh, energy, water, greenhouse gas emissions, and you can even look over consumption over time. Additionally, you have the ability to track green power or renewable energy certificates. Uh, the ability to share building performance data is really critical and also really helpful in the sense of the Pittsburgh 2030 District and 2030 District Challenge goals. Uh, we won't talk about sharing profiles in the one-on-one -on -one session, but will in the second, but it's important to understand the powerful ability um, that sharing building performance with your peers, your coworkers, or another organization allows you to a seamless uh, transition of data. In the sense of the Pittsburgh 2030 district, we share building performance data with the Pittsburgh 2030 district itself and back to the property owner, so we both have the ability to manage and see energy and water performance of those individual buildings. Also, Portfolio Manager has been developed for Energy Star certification, you know, a recognition measure for building performance and buildings that are performing at a higher success level. Uh, the Energy Star certification, we will talk a little bit about later, but if you're interested in applying for Energy Star certification, I push you to the EPA's website you can read some more about what building types are eligible for Energy Star certification and how to apply for it. Lastly, using Portfolio Manager as a management tool within the context of the Pittsburgh 2030 district. Now let's talk about performance tracking. The idea behind this is Portfolio Manager gives you the ability to track and see your performance of your buildings using energy and water data. You have the ability to benchmark any building in Portfolio Manager. Whether or not it's eligible for Energy Star certification doesn't matter. We really want you to begin to track and see how your buildings are performing, whether that's against a set goal or against a historic baseline. Speaking of baselines, within this performance area, you have the ability to compare your buildings or building um, to a couple different standards or performance metrics. The first would be against a historic baseline over time. For example, if you had energy data in from 2009 to 2016, you can set your baseline or your benchmark as the 2009 baseline. So therefore, you're comparing against your own consumption over time against a historic baseline. Also, you have the ability to compare against the national sample of similar buildings. For example, if you were an office building, say 100,000 square feet, you can compare against a national set of similar sized office buildings uh, and even weather normalized for your location. This is an important uh, aspect in context of 2030, which we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, and lastly, you can also compare against Energy Star score you know, a relative measure against similar building types and functions of peer buildings nationally. And within the 2030 district 
challenge goals of a 50% reduction against the national median average, you have the ability in Portfolio Manager to set targets, essentially. So a little bit later, we'll talk about setting some of those goals and targets, but rather than comparing against the historic performance, you can set those targets and say a national median of sample buildings, 50% reduction from those baselines. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about the background of Portfolio Manager, what it does, and also the Pittsburgh 2030 district, let's talk a little bit about how we get started benchmarking a building or what we need to bring to the table in order to get this process happening. So first, we need a couple of basic level data points and information. Um, information about your building, such as property information, basic knowledge of building function. Uh, so I'm going to keep using the, a similar example of an office building. So in, let's say this is an office building, 100,000 square feet. You know, our building function is office. There's over 85 uh, building types to choose from, 15 of which are eligible for Energy Star. Um, but go through, and if you're not sure what the function of your building is, there is a document online that outlines every building use type and what is comprised within those building use types. I think you'd be surprised at what level of details fall within an office building. For example, elevator shafts, stairwells, um, and so forth. Uh, you'll have to name it and also have the address of the building. The address is important. Uh, the zip code is used for weather normalization to make your building uh, comparable to other climate zones, essentially. And also the year that the building was built is important as well. Uh, that's kind of the basic property information. And then you'll need a little bit more granule property data, uh, such as gross square feet. This is square feet from exterior wall to exterior wall, including the basement. Um, you will also need use details such as operating hours, number of computers, full-time equivalents, etc. Now these property use details will change based off of what building function or type you select. Um, for example, if you select a restaurant, you will be asked different use detail questions in relation to the cooking facility, refrigeration, rather than an office building questions. And the third thing you will need is consumption data in the form of energy and water. Now it is important to bring all energy uses and water use to the table when setting up your building uh, or at least entering in all of the energy and water use at a later time, uh, such as electricity, natural gas, steam, chilled water, hot water, um, so forth. Also, it's important to note here that you're going to need 12 full calendar months of data to begin benchmarking your building to really kind of see some of the back-end data and receive kind of a national median uh, baseline. Uh, one nuance there is that if you have mid-month billing, I suggest you bring 13 months of, of data because the mid-month bill will automatically go to the next month's first date. So if you have a January 15th bill, the first date that Portfolio Manager will really look at is February 1st. So if you bring 12 months that are mid-month, you might only really have 11 full months. So to be safe, uh, 13 full calendar months. So now that we've talked a little bit about um, how and what Portfolio Manager is, let's kind of learn uh, some of the navigation of the actual program. And then we'll talk about adding adding and editing proper information. Uh, so some of the navigation features before we jump into the live demo, um, there's really two levels of tabs. There's a tab structure for Portfolio Manager. Okay, now that we've seen the portfolio level and property level tabs, uh, let's go a little bit further in a live demo of navigating Portfolio Manager. So when you log in or go to Energy Star Portfolio Manager website, this is the home page that you will land on. Here you can learn about Portfolio Manager, if it's right for you, kind of how to benchmark a building. You can take a look at the functions and property type list and understand maybe what your function of your building is. Uh, there's some helpful 
you know, starter kits or 101 sessions with some screenshots that you can dive in a little bit deeper if you want some more information on how to navigate or set up a building. Also, there are some, some information here on the left-hand side about calculations that are used on the back end if you want to understand more about uh, the national median average or some parking garage information or some of the data that's on the back end of Portfolio Manager. I recommend looking at that. Um, but for now, we're going to learn how to set up an account in a building. So on this right-hand side, you'll see uh, what is a login screen. If you have a username and password, go ahead and log in. Otherwise, you're going to click sign up and create an account. You'll land on this page where you'll create a username and password and some basic information about yourself. Um, once you have done uh, basic information about yourself, you now have an account and you'll be able to log in. So let's say that you created an account, um, you went to log in, you will now come to this page. I'll go ahead and log into an account that we have set up for this. Once you log in, you'll land on this page. Now this is your account homepage or your portfolio homepage. Here at the top, you can see those portfolio level tabs that we were talking about earlier. Um, in addition to some other dialog boxes such as notifications, this is where you'll see sharing requests, uh, updates that have happened, connections to be made, and so forth. Uh, on the left hand side, you'll see some some basic graphs that will generate based off of the building information that you have in here. Right now, we only have uh, 12 months of data in one building, so you won't really see any trend lines there. But if you have multiple years of data, you'll see a quick graph there. Um, additionally, uh, when looking to set up a building or add it for the first time, you won't see anything listed here in properties. Now, there's three ways to add a building or edit building data. The first and easiest way, which we'll talk about in depth, is to add a property manually, which is either right here or right here in the left-hand corner up at the top. Click that, it'll take you to the next page. We'll do that here in a second. Otherwise, you can use a third-party um, web service to push and pull information. Possibly you might have a utility that has green button data and has the ability to push and pull from Portfolio Manager, in which case they might create a profile. Um, look into your service area and if that option is available. Otherwise, the third option is to use a spreadsheet uh, to upload or update property information. Um, that is located right here um, at the bottom left-hand corner. So we're going to go ahead and click on that. It's going to take you to this screen right here. Now, it depends what you're doing. If you're adding a building for the first time, you're going to look in this right-hand side for the Add Properties template. Um, otherwise, you can create an upload template, which might be for adding meter data or editing building details, uh, so forth. But adding a property would obviously, obviously be the first step. So that's what you're going to look for, add a property. It's pretty self-explanatory. The first page of the Excel spreadsheet will give you an overview of how to insert the information and what is important. Once you have saved that template, you will then uploading it, upload it as a new property. Choose find the file on your server and upload. Just of note, this is, you know, they have a, a note here, this is a powerful feature. Once you upload it, it's hard to go back. So just be sure that the information you're providing in that Excel spreadsheet is accurate to the best of your knowledge. Okay. So let's say, let's go back to one page here. If you click on the Portfolio Manager logo, it'll take you there. Or if you click on the My Portfolio, it'll take you back to the home page. So here again, we're on our home page, and we're going to add a property manually. So I'm going to go ahead and click a property. Now you have to select three things, your property type, uh, how many buildings, if it's a single building or more than one building, and if it's an existing building. So continuing off of the example that we've been using, let's say this is an office building. So I'm going to scroll down and find office. I missed it. Right there. 
And here you can find out more about property types if you're curious and are unsure of your property type. Next, you will select how many physical buildings do you consider part of your property. In many cases, it will be one building. Otherwise, you might be just benchmarking a tenant space or a part of a building. Um, then the third option would be more than one. This is uh, kind of a campus of buildings, and you can use the guide here to find out more about how to set up that campus. It's a little bit different than one building. For example, you will have a parent property and then child properties. So if you have a meter structure at your campus of buildings where you have a master meter uh, feeding you know, a number of buildings, let's say five buildings, you'll create a parent property and then those children properties will then receive the energy from the parent property, if that makes sense. So you're, ben you're benchmarking the campus rather than individual buildings. But again, if that is your case, uh, click on the campus guidance for more information. It's really helpful. And then the last item that you need to select is whether this building is an existing building, a design project that you're just using some metered or modeled energy data to see and design your building, or it's a test property. In most cases, you will be clicking existing, but for this 101 webinar, I'm going to use a test property. And we're going to go ahead and click get started, and we're going to name our property. Okay, test three, United States, we'll say one, two, three, grant. Again, the zip code is important for that weather normalization. And then we'll say 1900, as are many buildings here in Pittsburgh. The gross square floor area, this is important. Again, uh, make sure that you are reading the description here at the bottom and making sure that the gross square floor area is the correct floor area of your building, exterior to exterior, including basements. One note to be made here is on parking. Parking is a little bit different in Portfolio Manager. So when thinking about gross square floor area, you're actually excluding parking. So let's say, for our example of a 100,000 square foot office building, we have 20,000 square feet of underground parking. Uh, so we're going to consider the gross square floor area 100,000 square feet, and then we will add parking in as we get down a little bit further in this process. The reason we do this is because parking is not considered um, Energy Star certified in Portfolio Manager, and also they're just looking at the actual uh, structure of the building excluding parking. So we include parking later on to make sure that we're accounting for that energy use in terms of lighting and possibly ventilation. But in terms of the actual physical structure being benchmarked, it's uh, the office building, or it could be a different function in your case. If you have your parking garage submetered or separately metered, you don't have to include the parking garage square footage. You can just exclude the square feet and the energy use associated with that. So we'll say 100,000 square feet. Um, our occupancy is 100%. The occupancy is important because you need an occupancy 50% or greater to apply for Energy Star certification. Lastly, there's a couple of prompted questions that might help you along the way. You can either do this now or you can do it later on in the process. For example, let's do the parking like we just talked about. Uh, so my property energy consumption includes parking areas because it's under one one master meter, let's say. So I'm going to go ahead and check that. You also have the ability to enter a data center, um, but you must have the data center metered separately um, in order for this to properly work. Additionally, you know, my property might have retail or restaurants on the first floor. So you can either click those buttons or you can add them in later, and I'll show you that process. So go ahead and click to the next page. You'll see the basic information that you've entered thus far, the name, the type, uh, the age, so forth. If you scroll down a little bit further, you'll see the use type that we entered. So we entered office building. Uh, here you have the ability to edit the name. We're just going to name it office. And you should read the description underneath office so you can understand, again, what is included in the office use type. Uh, the second paragraph down explains it. The office includes conference rooms, auditoriums, 
break rooms, kitchen, lobbies, fitness areas, basements, storage areas, stairwells, and elevator shafts. So make sure when you're looking at gross square footage, you include those, but also you don't necessarily have to break out a kitchen separately because it's included within the office use designation. And then again, if you have restaurants or retail on the first floor, you're going to have to break those out separately. Look at those bullet points for some more explanation on Energy Star certification and square footage thresholds. So it's going to pre-populate the gross square footage here of 100,000 square feet. Then we start to get in some property use details, such as weekly operating hours, number of full-time equivalents, and so forth. Again, it's important to fill out this information for Energy Star certification. If you don't know it offhand right now, you can put in use a default based off your square footage. The default values will be calculated. Also, you will see current as of. Uh, you can leave this the same. This is just saying that your building uh, is 100,000 square feet and has been 100,000 square feet. Uh, if for some reason you have an addition built or you increase in square feet, then you can go back later into the use type and change the current as of date to reflect when you made those changes. So continue to scroll down and we have the parking use that we selected on the previous page. Uh, it is important to make sure you enter in values for each one of these parking, uh, whether it's open, partial, or fully enclosed. So we, we're going to say it's an underground parking structure, so we'll put in zeros there. And let's say it's 20,000 square feet of underground parking and there's no supplemental heating. So at this point, we have kind of the details in the function of our building and we're going to continue to the next page. So once you create the profile or the building, you will then have a kind of home page for your building. Uh, we talked earlier about the summary or property level tabs. You can see them here. Portfolio Manager made an update and we now have energy and water separate tabs rather than just meters. So again, here you can kind of see any notifications you may have. You can type in a property profile and some information about your building. You can even add a picture. Again, you'll see some basic graphs of energy use and also greenhouse gas. Uh, you can share your property down here on the right hand side. Um, you can also check for possible errors. You won't see any information in this metric summary right off the bat because we don't have any meter data in the profile or building yet. As we enter 12 months or more of energy and water or water information, this metric summary page will populate with your baseline information and your current as of usage. So the next tab is that details tab. Here on the left-hand side, you can see the property gross square feet as we entered it, the occupancy. Uh, if that ever changed, you can go ahead and edit it here. Let's say you entered in the wrong uh, square footage, you can go ahead and edit that. And if you do, you need to make sure that it's reflected here in the property use details. So right now we have office at 100, which reflects the 100,000 that we've put in prior to entering the office square feet. Um, additionally, here you can see parking at 20,000. They're broken out separately here, um, and because we have office at 100 and our gross square feet at 100, they're the same essentially. If we had selected office at 80 and then parking at 20, thinking it's 100,000 square feet in total, we're going to see an error that says your gross square feet as entered self-reported is different from what your property details say. So this looks accurate for our, for our use right now. You'll see a little breakout of the use type. And if you click on energy, we will be our next section. So right now, we don't have any energy information entered in. Uh, you can see this little explanation point in red that's signifying that we either don't have something or there's an error. So here we're going to add a meter. Go ahead and click add a meter. There's also another way you can do it with a uh, spreadsheet, but for now we're going to look at just the manual entering of a, a meter itself. And then we can show you a couple of different methods of entering the actual data. So go ahead and click add a meter. You'll be directed to this page where you'll select your sources of energy. For this example, we're going to say this building is electric 
purchase from the grid. You also have the ability to select some on-site generation. So let's say you have some solar panels. You can create a separate meter for those solar panels, and that will come into play when looking at your building's energy use. Additionally, this building has natural gas, both of which have one meters. So let's go ahead and click Get Started. You can see some other fuel types that are available to you um, depending upon your area. So the next page, you'll be able to determine the name of your meter, select the units, and so forth. Um, so it gives you a pre-populated name. Feel free to enter in possibly your account number for ease later on when looking at if you had multiple electric accounts, you might get confused. Um, and also the units. Now the units are important because often the units might not necessarily directly reflect what you see on your bills. So it's important to understand what the actual units for your billing is in relation to what portfolio manager units are. For example, uh, in most cases, your natural gas here in Pittsburgh comes in MCF, and the capital M represents a factor of 1,000. So that's really 1,000 cubic feet. But if we look here in Portfolio Manager, we see MCF, they have it listed as million cubic feet. So it's important to make sure that you read what the actual units stand for. Um, if you were talking in millions, often on your bill, you would see two lowercase m's. Um, but for this, it's important to understand that if it's MCF, it's probably talking about 1,000 cubic feet. So select the 1,000 cubic feet um, and the date the meter became active. This is also important because if you select the day the building was built, uh, you're going to come back with an error that says you're missing, you know, 115 years of energy data. So what you want to do is you want to select the date the meter became active as the first date of bills that you're going to put into the profile. So let's say you have 2014 bills starting on January 1st. You're going to enter in 1-1-2014. And the meter is still active, so you won't select anything there. Um, then you will jump down to the other meter, which in most all cases is going to be in kilowatt hours or KWH. And let's say the meter bill is the same date that we'll start recording. So that is pretty simple, and we'll go ahead and create those meters. Now that you're here, uh, you'll see the natural gas and the electric meters. And this is where I suggested earlier that there's multiple ways to enter this data. First, let's do the manual way. So you'll go ahead and click to add an entry. The start date, the end date, and the actual usage. And if you want, you can add the cost. I suggest adding the cost so you can track that metric as well. Um, so the start date as we entered in for the meter itself was 1-1-2014. One, one, you have the ability to change these dates at any time, so if for some reason the, the date is wrong and you find out later, you can come back and change those. Um, and it's going to pre-populate you know, 30 days or 31 days a month uh, to the end date. If that end date is, is different for some reason, go ahead and change it. And then your KCF usage, uh, 1500, let's say, it is the month of January. And then let's say $2,000. If you want to add another entry, then you're going to go ahead and add another entry. It'll give a drop down line, and then you can continue to enter data here and so forth. This might be the best, best method if you only have 12 months of data and you can just kind of crush through this pretty easily. Um, but let's say you have five years of historic data that you want to enter in. Um, this could take a little bit of time. So the other option for doing that is this spreadsheet template right here. So if you click Upload Data in Bulk, click the spreadsheet template, it will download a template into Excel that looks, looks like this. This is a completed one, but it will look like this. Um, the start date, the end date, uh, usage, cost. Make sure you select whether it's an estimation or not. Again, you can always go back and change this. Um, so I'm going to close this and show you one that's completed. 
So here is electric use for the year of 2014. Uh, we have all of our start dates and our end dates in addition to usage, cost, and none of which are estimates. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to upload it by choosing the file. Electric, actually, I lied. This is natural gas. Make sure you're uploading the right template to the right spot. So we're going to jump down to electric. And go ahead and upload electric. And you will see all of your data that you had in that spreadsheet. Go ahead and jump into this profile. Um, one other thing I'm going to do, just so you can see an example of something wrong. Uh, let's say that we entered in a bad date. And let's say this was 3, 4, or sorry, 3, 3 rather than 3, 4, or 5. So essentially we're missing a day between the two bills. You're going to go ahead and say continue, and you're going to get an error. Uh, one or more of your meters contains gaps. Um, let's say you continue. It's going to take you out of this page. Um, and you're going to have to select whether those two meters apply for all of the energy consumption in your building. In most cases it will. So go ahead and apply those meters. Now when you go back to energy, you're going to see an error, that little red explanation point here, uh, because we have something wrong. So if we click on that, that meter, we can begin to identify where the problem is. So here you'll see in this yellow bar or box that there's a gap of one day between the two entries. So that's pretty easy, straightforward. You can see the gap. Um, if you entered in an overlap, it'll say something similar, that there's an overlap of days. Um, but here we just need to change our date to reflect that of the start date of the next month. So once we do that, go ahead and click Save Bills. And congratulations, we have successfully updated the bills. Additionally, when you log in, you might see only one bill, and you, can, you might be a little confused as to why it's only showing one. You can click Display Years and Show All, or you can select specific years to show. So now that we've saved the bills, uh, we're going to jump out. If you click on the name of your building here, it will take you back to the home screen of that building. So now that we've seen how to enter energy, uh, it's very similar for water. You'll add a meter, select the units, and then add in the consumption. What I'm going to do is jump to a completed profile just so we can see what that will look like. So once you have 12 or 13 months of utility data, you will have the ability to see a full metric summary. Because we only have 12 months of data, the baseline year and the current year are the same, but as you start to enter in more information, the baseline year will stay the same, and the current year will reflect whatever the last bill that you have in there. Again, you can change the time period. So if you want to change the baseline date, uh, you can do that by clicking Change Time Period. And once you have data in there, you can also see a quick graph that is generated uh, this is an easy way to see if there's any anomalies or problems. Um, in addition to the water, we'll have the same thing. Lastly, the last tab we'll talk about today is the Goals tab. So again, here you can set and change baselines or targets. Right now we have a target of a 50% reduction, as is the 2030 challenge goal. So right now we have our, you can see our baseline of 2014, Again, our current date uh, is the same because we only have 12 months. But here you can see the target um, is a 50% reduction from the site UI in both cases. Or, I'm sorry, the target is 50% from the national median. Because we set the target to be and reflect national median average not necessarily historic baseline. You do have the ability to select 50% from your historic baseline, or you can select 50% from the median property. It's important to talk about this. This is the median property column. 
it goes back to saying a representative sample of buildings similar to your property type. So here we're comparing against you know, similarly sized 100,000 square feet office buildings and then your building is weather normalized um, and you're comparing against that set of similar functioning buildings. So the national median for office buildings at that size is about 134.6. This will change based off of your fuel type that you're using. But our current is 97.2. Uh, so that percent reduction is you know, 97.2 from the 134 baseline. And that's essentially the, the metrics that we're using for 2030 district um, in addition to a number of other programs. So that's about it in terms of the 101 walkthrough of how to navigate Portfolio Manager, how to add and edit property information, um, and additionally some information on metrics within the Pittsburgh 2030 District and the 2030 Challenge. Again, my name is Isaac Smith. My contact information is right there. If you have any questions, feel free to give me an email um, and I'll get back to you with some helpful answers, hopefully. Additionally, I urge you to go on to Energy Star's website and look around for additional content and possibly FAQs and some toolkits. Again, thanks for taking the time. Uh, look for a 201 session where we'll dive a little bit deeper into some metrics, how to create reports and so forth to get the most out of your data that you're putting into Portfolio Manager. Thanks.